Well, good evening. It's great to be with you. Thank you for that kind introduction. What, what a delight to see so many people out to hear God's Word on a Friday night. That, is, um, that brings joy uh, to my heart. So my passage tonight is Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. But before we dive into that, let's pray again. Our Father, we thank you that this is your word and your truth, that you have revealed yourself to us uh, truly. And Lord, we know that we are easily distracted, and we pray that your spirit would come on every heart in here, and that you would speak to us, that you would uh, confirm truth to our hearts, and that you would warm our hearts by your Holy Spirit. We need you every hour. We need you this hour. So please come, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, some people say Romans is the most important book in the Bible. Every book in the Bible is fully inspired. Every book of the Bible is infallible. Every book of the Bible is without error. But that doesn't mean, right, it doesn't mean that some books aren't more important than others. Every book's important. But Romans is more important than First Chronicles. First Chronicles is a great book. But Romans is more important than First Chronicles. I think we can say that. Without, without diminishing the importance of First Chronicles. So... But, and, but some people say Romans is the most important book in the whole Bible. I didn't say that. I said some people say that, right? <laughs> some people say that. Maybe it's true. And then some people say the most important passage in Romans is this one, Romans 3, verses 21 through 26. So you could say, you could say this is the most important passage in the Bible, I don't know if an argument like that is convincing, but, but at least we can say, if I'm going to back up and we want to be modest about it, at least we can say, this is a very important passage. Is it the most important passage of the Bible? We don't have to argue about that, do we? But we can say, this text is a very crucial text. And I, what I want to say tonight is this, this, this passage is absolutely crucial for our joy, for our happiness as believers, for, for, being delight, for delighting in God. So I want to read you something that somebody wrote almost 100 years ago about what it means to be a Christian. And this is what he says. What exactly has Christ done for you? What is there in your life that needs Christ to explain it and that apart from him simply could not have been there at all? If there is nothing, then your religion is sheer futility. But then that is your fault, not Jesus Christ. For when we open the New Testament, it is to come upon whole companies of excited people, their faces all aglow, their hearts dazed and bewildered by the immensity of their own good fortune. Apparently, they find it difficult to think of anything but this amazing happening that has befallen them. Quite certainly, they cannot keep from laying almost violent hands on any chance passerby and pouring out yet once again the whole astounding story. And always... As we listen, they keep throwing up their hands as if in sheer despair, telling us it is hopeless, that it breaks through language, that it won't describe, that until a man has known Christ for himself, he can have no idea 
of the enormous difference that he makes. It is as when a young woman gives away her heart or as when a little one is born to very you or when after long, lean years of pain and grayness, health comes back. You can't, you can't really describe that. You cannot put it into words adequately. Only the whole world is different and life is gloriously new. Well, it's like that, they say. Let's read our passage from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Romans chapter 3, starting verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So verses 21 and 22 teach us that God has manifested his righteousness, his saving righteousness in Jesus Christ. And, and I want to return to that in a moment. That's the introduction of the passage, right? God's saving righteousness is ours through faith in Jesus. But verse 23 is very important. Because verse 23 explains to us why we need that saving righteousness. Did, did you notice? Did you notice in verse 23, if you look at your Bibles, what's the first word in verse 23? It's the word for. So, so that word is ex explaining to us why we need the saving righteousness of God. Well, it's a verse many of you know very well. Many of you probably have it memorized. And, and the reason... The reason we need God's saving righteousness is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Did you notice something? All have sinned. There's no, there's no exception. There's, there's no one who can claim that they pleased God. Think of, the, think of the most righteous person you know. I mean, sometimes people mention Gandhi. But Gandhi, Gandhi sinned too, Right? I think of our neighbor in Minnesota. She was, she was, she was Jewish and her husband was Catholic. She was, she was maybe, besides my wife, of course, the nicest person I've ever met. <laughs> she, was, she was so nice, you know? She was, she was an incredible neighbor. She was a lot nicer than a lot of Christians I've met. But she she's sinned, right? She also has sinned. She also falls short of the glory of God. She has not pleased God. She's, she's not a believer in Jesus. You know, if we go back in Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 18 tells us that God's wrath is revealed from heaven because of the ungodliness and wickedness of human beings. God, God's wrath, God's anger, God's anger what do you think of God's anger? God's, God's anger is righteous. It's, it's holy. God, God's anger is so unlike human anger, right? God's anger is, it's, it's beautiful, isn't it? Romans chapter 1 verse 21 says, we've sinned because, how have we sinned? We failed to give God thanks. We failed to, we failed, we failed to glorify him and honor him as we should. And, 
And that, that failure to honor and glorify him shows up especially in lack of gratitude, lack of, lack of thankfulness, lack of, lack of joy, right? Joy, joy in him, thankfulness to him. You know, many people in our culture, they totally reject the idea that God's angry about sin. They think all anger is unworthy of God. But again, I must say, we've got to distinguish between our own anger that can be unrighteous and wicked and God's holy and righteous anger. Those who reject God's righteous anger, they do so because they, they do not and they cannot understand the gospel. I mean, this is where almost everybody in our culture is, and we understand that. And apart from the gospel, this is where we are. Hell makes no sense. Hell makes no sense to people today. Final judgment doesn't make any sense to people. But, but if final judgment doesn't make any sense, neither does salvation, right? I mean, if there's no final judgment, there's no need for salvation. But most people in our culture, what do they think? There will not be any final judgment. There isn't a hell. Everybody who dies are going to be fine. I mean, I'm a, I'm a sports fan. I remember years ago, this guy who played for the New York Yankees, some of the, you who are older may remember this, his name was Thurman Munson. And Thurman Munson died. I think it was a plane crash or something, but he was fairly young. He died. Well, you know, if you've read about Thurman Munson, what did everybody say about him when he was a player? He was a crabby, difficult person. But what did they say when he died? Oh, Thurman was great, right? Didn't we all love Thurman, you know? Wasn't he a wonderful person? Isn't that what happens when anybody dies now? Of course, we got to be sensitive at funerals. I'm not, I'm not arguing against that, what we say. But, but that's the whole culture now. Everybody's going to be fine. I, I, someone really close to me died recently, but not a, not a believer unless they repented at the last moment. Unlikely, though, that they did. And, and I was talking to the person on, another person on the phone, and they said he was very spiritual, you know? He was very, very spiritual. And he's fine now. So that, that, that's the narrative, but that narrative denies what? The wrath of God, the righteous wrath of God, and it denies hell, and it makes no sense of the New Testament, and it makes no sense of salvation. So remember, Adam and Eve, they were thrown out of the garden by God, cast away from his presence. They died spiritually and eventually died physically for what? One sin. God could have said, let's try that again. <laughs> let's do it over. You'll get it the second time. They just didn't do that, right? One sin, you're out. Now, obviously there was an opportunity for salvation, but, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Not, not for the devils who sinned, right? No opportunity to be saved after that, right? One sin for the devils, it's over forever. God's righteous, isn't he? God's good. They deserve it, right? God's not obligated to give them an opportunity to be saved. And he didn't give them one. But he did to human beings. He did to Adam and Eve. So that, you know, that, that's an important part of the gospel, right? That Roman, verse 23 is really important to understand what Paul's saying here. If we, if we don't understand that sin deserves eternal punishment, if we don't get that, we don't understand the glory and beauty of God's saving righteousness. And we're not very thankful either. I'll return to that. Even as Christians, we continue to sin and fall short of the glory of God. By, by the way, I'm not denying for a moment that we've been changed by God's grace as believers. I mean, one of, one of the great truths of the gospel is God has transformed us, right? Yeah, we're, we're different 
as Christians, we're all growing at different at a different pace, perhaps, but we're different from what we were before. We're changed, but but we 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 do we continue to sin as well. We do not honor and glorify God as we should. I don't honor and glorify God as I should. That's true of all of us. If you if you think about the last week, maybe if you think about today, it's not too hard to think about how we've sinned against God. Perhaps perhaps something you did even this morning can come to your mind. Sin sin is subtle. Sin is powerful. I, I, I was listening to National Public Radio. One financial analyst said 30% of the population spend money when they're down and discouraged and they're depressed to make themselves feel better. We're, we're tempted, we're tempted, aren't we, to spend money to boost, to boost our feelings, so to, to, get a little, to get a little shot to keep us going, so to speak. We may feel depressed and exhausted, and so we eat more than we should because it makes us feel better. Even the good things we do are touched by sin. We may make sure that we insert into a conversation how well our children are doing so that the people we talk to are impressed with us. We might make sure to tell people how well our business is doing or our grades or whatever, our sporting accomplishments. I mean, it's not wrong to share those things necessarily, is it? But, but, it, but the motive may be, right, to bring glory to ourselves. Or, or we might feel proud, I never do that. I don't do that. I'm not a braggart. I don't do that. Yes, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And once we understand that, the truth of God's saving righteousness is precious and it's beautiful to us. So let's look back at verses 21 and verse 22. The righteousness of God has been manifested now at this time in salvation history with the coming of Jesus Christ. It's important. That text says, but now, the now is with the coming of Jesus. The righteousness of God has invaded history, so to speak. It's intersected history. He's, he, Jesus has come from heaven. What, what does Paul mean by the righteousness of God? He, t- he mentions it. Do you see that? In verses 21 and 22. And uh, I think the, the righteousness of God, Paul uses court metaphors here. The, the, picture, the picture here is of God as the judge, and he's adjudicating a case, and he's uh, delivering a verdict, right? And the verdict, verses 21 and 22, is here, in this context, not guilty. Not guilty. The verdict here is you are counted as righteous. You are, you are declared to be free from sin. I, 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 had a, I had a friend who was a judge uh, long ago when I was in Oregon, and uh, he even looked like a judge, at least my image of a judge. What are judges supposed to look like, right? But, but he, had, he had the white hair, and, the, the, and he, said, he said, let's have lunch and come into my courtroom and... I'm going to adjudicate a case. So, so I did, and it, it was a very minor case. I don't know anything really about the law, but it, I, you know, there, there were these lawyers coming in, and they were this 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 guy had com- committed this alleged crime, and but the 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 defendant didn't have a lawyer. It was just, so uh, you know, it was just it was just the judge and the attorneys and the defendant. And the, uh, the attorneys came in and they were saying why he was guilty, doom, boom, 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 boom. They were saying all these things. The judge asked a couple questions. He asked a qu- couple questions of the defendant. Must have been a very minor case because then the judge just turned to the defendant and he said, not guilty. And the, lawyer, the lawyers went out of the room sputtering and maybe saying not very nice words. And, uh, but he was free, right? 
Didn't matter. Didn't matter what those attorneys thought. The judge said, not guilty. You're, you're, you're free to go. And, uh, and, and he went out of the room. That's what this text is talking about, right? It's a verdict. It's a verdict, not guilty. You're righteous. It, we, we can say it's the saving it's the saving righteousness of God, and it's, it's apart from the law. It, it doesn't come from, from the work of the law. And notice what he says. He says, the, the law and the prophets bear witness to it. It's apart from the law. It's apart from obedience to the law. But the law and the prophets, that stands for the whole Bible, right? The law and the prophets, it's what the Old Testament teaches as well. There's not two different ways of salvation. Right? This is very important, isn't it? The, the Old Testament and the New Testament teach one way of salvation by faith alone. There's not, salvation wasn't by works in the Old Testament. The law and the prophets, the Old Testament scriptures, they bear witness to what's said here. Salvation, God's righteousness, is by faith. Let's look at verse 22. This righteousness of God, I've been saying this, is, is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe for there's no distinction. It's for everybody. It's for everybody everywhere. It's for everyone who believes. How can I be right with God? The most important question in life, the most important issue in life, how can I be right with God? And it's available for everyone, all people. It's available right for, for Brazilians and Argentinians and, 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 and people from Cameroon and, and for Nigerians and for Palestinians and for Israelis and for Canadians and for the Japanese, right, and the Chinese and for Koreans and Australians and Germans and on and on we could go for everybody, everybody everywhere, for, for, for Uyghurs, right, for, for um, Jordanians and, and, and every people group you can think of. And the gospel has gone throughout the world, hasn't it? So this is a great emphasis on, in Romans. The gospel is for everyone, everyone, everyone you meet, right? The gospel is offered to them. What, what, what do we have to do to be accounted as right? We, what does he say? It's by faith. It's, it's by faith in Jesus. Not, not just any faith, right? Faith in Jesus Christ. We'll, co we'll come back to the focus on Jesus, but it's faith in Jesus Christ for those who, who believe. We're, we're not, it, this is the best news in the world. I, I was raised as a Catholic, you know? As a Catholic, at least I understood, I understood, hey, I'll, I'll, I, didn't, I didn't really care about this, right? When I, was, when I was growing up, I became a believer when I was 17 to the person who's my wife now. I became a believer. Um, she's sitting right here in the front row. She, she shared with me the good news. But every once in a while when I was a Catholic, I'd think, I wonder if I'll go to heaven. And then I'd think, I wonder if I'm good enough. I wonder if I'm good enough to go to heaven. And then I'd think, I don't know. I don't know if I'm good enough. Then I'd think, but I think I'm 51% good. <laughs> and that, that'll probably be enough. But then I'd think, am I really 51% good? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And then I'd forget about it, and I wouldn't think about it maybe for two more years. You know? It, it just flit into my mind like that, and then it just go away. And I, wouldn't, I didn't think about it for a long time. But what does this text say? It, it says... We're not right before God because we've worked for God, but because we've believed in Christ, right? We're, we're, not, we're not right with God by, by, by performing, right? But by, by, by trusting, not, not, not by achieving, right? But by, but by believing, not, not, by, not by working, but resting. So that, 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 that's the good news I, I discovered when I was 17, and it was so freeing to me and so amazing. And I, I, I was reading the Bible when I was 17, and I went out to my mom, and I said, 
mom, and, and I love my mom, my mom, she, she's not alive, she's an amazing, my mom was amazing, so gentle, so kind, so just, I, you know, I, I love my mom so much, and, she, and my mom was a reader, and I said, mom, the Bible says, I don't know what I said exactly, because I don't, didn't know any theology then, but something like this, right, I said, mom, the Bible says we're saved by faith, not by works, and my mom said, I'll never forget it, I don't believe that. I was like, wow, mom doesn't believe the Bible. <laughs> and by then, I was reading the Bible, and I knew my mom didn't read the Bible, and I loved her dearly, but I went back to my room, and the Holy Spirit, right, he takes the word, and I knew mom's wrong. I knew it. I didn't have any doubts. I knew my, my, mom doesn't know, you know? Mom doesn't know what the Bible says. She doesn't read the Bible. And the Holy Spirit had taken that word and just sealed it to my heart. That is great news, brothers and sisters. We are saved. We are saved through faith. Well, what does he say? Why does safe faith save us, right? That, that's the question. Why does faith save us? Well, what does it say in the text? Verse 24, we're justified by his grace as a gift. We see an emphasis here, don't we? By believing, it's grace. Hey, it's grace. Hey, it's a gift. You keep saying the same thing. It's free, right? It's not, it's not based on works. And then he says, but how? How? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What, what is, people, people don't use the language of redemption much anymore. What does redemption mean? What's the word people use today? You're free. You're liberated, right? You're free. You're, you're ransomed. I, I just saw in the paper today, I didn't read about it, just saw, not the paper, I don't read the paper, but you know, that's an old time, old time way of talking, but uh, I, saw, I saw the headline that two American hostages were freed, right? I'm sure some of you read about it. They're free. But that, this is, Jesus redeemed us. He freed us. He ransomed us. He liberated us. We were in slavery, though, to our own sin. He freed us from ourselves, Right? He freed us from the devil, too. So we're free. We're, we're liberated. But that leads to another question. How can God do that? How, how can God declare us to be in the right? Doesn't that violate God's holiness? And Paul answers that question in verses 25 and 26. I want to read it again because these are very important verses. He answers the question, how can God do that? That is, how can God declare us to be in the right without violating his own character, his own holiness, his own justice? He says, God put forward Christ as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So the key word here is the word propitiation. Okay, this is a little bit technical, but just for a moment. There's big debates over this word. The Christian Standard Bible translated, translates it as the mercy seat. The mercy seat, the place where God shows mercy to his people. Are our sins propitiated or expiated? Two big words that people don't usually use, but I can explain them very simply. Is, so there's a big debate. Is it propitiation or expiation here? And the answer is yes. It's both. What's expiation? Expiation is your sins are wiped away, right? They're expiated. They're erased. They're done away with. Is it expiation? Yeah, it is expiation. What's propitiation? God's wrath is satisfied and it's appeased. Is it propitiation? Yes, because we read in Romans 1.18, God's wrath is against sinners. So our sins are expiated. They're erased. They're wiped away at the cross. And God's wrath is propitiated and satisfied at at the cross. But I just want to say, many people, they don't like this idea. I started with this. They don't like this idea that God's wrath is propitiated. Here, here's the word of a New Testament scholar, 
not a believer, but a New Testament scholar. This is what he says. The doctrine of the atonement, the claim that God killed his own son in order to satisfy his thirst for satisfaction is sub-rational and sub-ethical. What does that mean? It's an irrational doctrine, right? And not only is it irrational, it's wicked. It's sub-ethical. He, he goes on to call it, it's a monstrous doctrine, he says. Well, he feels a little bit strongly about that, right? <laughs> but what, what does the Bible say? God, because of his great love, sent his son. This is not child abuse. He sent his son who willingly, and because of his own great love for us, came for our salvation. God, out of love, sent his own son to satisfy his own wrath. His, his, and his own wrath represents, again, his justice. There's no idea here. God's really angry, and Jesus comes to appease that angry, but God's not loving. God's not loving, but Jesus is. No, God, out of love, sent his son, who came out of love, to satisfy his own wrath. There are mysteries here about the person of God, aren't there? And, and he did that. He did that to demonstrate his own righteousness. Now, now here's, here's, here's what, this is really important. In verses 21 and 22, I think the righteousness of God is God's saving righteousness by which we're counted to be right before him. The judge says you're not guilty. But in verses 25 and 26, He's talking about God's judging righteousness, his holiness, his justice. God, God sent his son out of love, and his son came in love to demonstrate his righteousness, to satisfy God's holiness. And that, that justice and righteousness is satisfied in, in the cross. Why? Here's a question. Why is God's righteousness called in the question. And what does Paul say? He says, this was to show God's righteousness, verse 25, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. So Paul says, get this, is God righteous because he's been passing over sins? Now, now, now let, let's let that hit us, right? Here, Here's what people say today. Our question is, maybe it's your question. Hey, it's been my question. I'm not, I'm not apart from you. Our question is, how does God send anyone to hell? That's what we say. How does God send anyone to hell? How does God judge anyone? How can, how can God do that? But do you see from the line I just read? Paul's question is a very different question. And his question is, how does God send anyone to heaven? It's a completely different question. We think we're human-centered. Paul's God-centered. The Bible's God-centered. We ask, how can, judge, how can God judge anyone? Paul asks, how can God save anyone? He says, right, what does verse 25 say? How can he pass over former sins? How can he do that? How, can, how is it that God doesn't punish us completely and fully right when he sins? That's the question. What a different question. What a different view of sin we have. How trivial we think sin is. So we may be outraged and angry when God punishes, but God views sin as deserving eternal punishment. But once we understand that our sin deserves eternal punishment and we believe and we're saved, then we're grateful, right? Then we're joyful. If, if, if we think God should save me, that's what he should do. There's a, there's a writer who said, God forgives that's his job. That's his job. God forgives. But if that's the way we think, we're not going to be thankful, right? Are you, are you thankful 
Are you grateful? Not, not just in your theology. You know, we could say, well, we should be thankful. But really? In your heart? Well, if not, and we all go up and down at times, right? Maybe you've forgotten the wonder and the glory and the beauty of the gospel. Because we're grateful when something happens to us that we feel like we don't deserve. We didn't deserve to receive that. You know, it's easy when we eat breakfast every morning to say, thanks God, thanks God for the breakfast. But if you get the flu and you can't eat for a few days, that's probably happened to all of us, right? And you're sick. Then when you can eat again, right? And you eat that first food again, what is it? It's like, wow, that toast is great, you know? <laughs> That is awesome. That is so good. And we're, we're grateful because we've kind of forgotten. Day after day, day after day, we start to take things for granted. I lived 11 years in Minnesota. I, I loved living in Minnesota. I really did. But Minnesota, I'm from Oregon originally. I'm not a native Minnesotan. And before I lived in Minnesota, I lived six years in Los Angeles area. So I love Minnesota, but sometimes, you don't understand it if you've never left this place, but sometimes, well, I guess it does get cold here, right? But sometimes the cold in Minnesota would get to me. I remember in 1991, October 31st, Halloween, or Reformation Day, right? <laughs> it snowed 28 inches. It was wonderful. I loved it. I loved it that day, right? But the next time, I charted it this year. The next time you could go outside and feel warmth on your skin was April 26th. <laughs> I charted it out. You know, when I lived in Los Angeles, I didn't go outside and say, oh, it's so great, it's warm. I mean, I did sometimes, but not the same. But in Minnesota, when it got warm, we were, everybody would go outside and say, it's awesome. Isn't it amazing? It's warm outside again. Oh, we better get outside now and enjoy it. Well, that's the way our salvation is, right? If we're grateful, if we think, oh, we've lived in the cold of our sin, now we've experienced the warmth of God's grace. We're thankful. We're so thankful and grateful that God has saved us. So, just theologically, I want to say something here. I think this text is telling us Christ had to die on the cross for us to be forgiven of our sins. God could not, think about this with me, God could not look down from heaven and simply say, I forgive you, I forgive you. So, I was in a debate a few years ago in Columbia, Missouri, we were, it was about Jesus. So I was in a debate with a Muslim, not, not a radical Muslim, but a Muslim, and, and a Unitarian, and our debate was on Jesus. And, and, and I think most people in the room agreed with the Muslim, and not me. Most of the people there weren't Christians, because if you don't understand the gospel, and I'll explain why. You know what the Muslim said? I thought it was really brilliant. He said, when my kid does something wrong, I just forgive him. I love my kid. I just forgive my kid. He goes, God doesn't have to send his son to be forgiven of his sin, your sins. God loves us. He just forgives us. What do you think if most people in the room thought? Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. That, that sounds good. Because I got up and said something like, no, that's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. That's wrong. God is holy. God is just. God can't just wink at sin. And I gave some illustration. God, God's justice has to be satisfied, and that's why he sent his son. There's no salvation apart from the cross. Well, if you're not a Christian, you don't understand that. Because, but I think this text is saying God's justice, God's holiness, God's righteousness has to be satisfied. Well, somebody might say, that doesn't sound good, because are you saying there's a law above God? You're saying God has to do something? Is there a law above God? N no, because it's God's own character. 
It's not, it's not, it's not something outside God saying you have to do this. No, it's, 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 it's who God is, his very being, right? He can't compromise his being. God can't lie, right? We're told that in Scripture. God can't die. God can't cease to be God. By very definition, God can't compromise his holiness. So how does this text end? This text ends by saying in verse 26, you see it, he, he did this at the present time so that he might be just. How, why did he send Christ? So he'd be just, holy, and righteous. And the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see why this passage is so great? Because at the cross, what comes together? The love of God and the holiness of God. They come together, right? He's just, holiness. He's the justifier, love. The lo love and justice come together. God's, God's judging righteousness, God's saving righteousness, they come together at the cross, right? God, God's, God's mercy, God's mercy and God's justice, they come together at the cross. That's why we glory. That's why we glory in the cross. Our God, God is, our God is loving. Our God is just and by God's grace, we're grateful, we're thankful. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it addresses us and reminds us of the great salvation that is ours in Jesus. And Lord, we know that thankfulness is a gift. And Lord, we pray you'd help us to see Jesus in, in all his glory, that we'd see your great love, we'd see your holiness, and justice in the cross, and that we'd be changed by it once again. Lord, come and do this work in us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.